verses 36 through 38. And um, if we start before this, if you look at the rest of, of Matthew chapter 9, you'll see that Jesus is going around in the region of Galilee. That was his home area. Remember that? Jesus was from that area. That's where he, after Bethlehem, they had moved into the region of Galilee. And um, Jesus grew up there. And so this is where he was ministering and performing miracles. And then... We come to verse 36, and we talked about this last week. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So there's our first image, sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. NIV says, so pray to the Lord of the harvest. It's the same, uh, it's the same meaning and ask him to send more workers into his fields. And I want us to look a little bit more at this this morning, and then we'll continue on with Jesus and his disciples going into the harvest fields, and we'll see more of that. But we see here the heart and the image of God, and I want us to, to focus on that for a while this morning, and we're going to a little bit later as well. Because we, as Christians, and I'm perhaps probably most of us this morning here are Christians, some of us may not be, but it's easy to get a very distorted image of God when we look at other people, when we look at religion, sometimes when we look at churches, and we get an idea that God is like this, and that church is like this, God is hard, God judges, um, God is very judgmental, God doesn't forgive easily, um, that God looks at the world and sees the mess that it's in and, and God sort of says, you deserve it because this is what you've chosen. Um, by the way, gake ne miu miu, I'm sorry, okay. And so we look at that and it's easy to get our thinking distorted. We, it's easy to get our view wrong. And when we get our thinking distorted and our view wrong, we must come back to the Word of God. We must come back to the Word of God because truth will always correct error. Truth will always, it never changes. Truth is what it is. It is God's truth. And because it is what it is, anything if this is how God says He is, and God is love, and God is this way, and maybe we look at God this way a little bit, we come back to the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, and then we line up with the Word of God. We must. Truth, truth is the standard. Not men, not churches, not religion. Truth is the standard. Truth is the standard. And it's a standard of love. It's a standard of love. And so this is how God is. And we see Jesus. He sees the crowd. They have so many needs. And He has compassion on them. I don't know about you, but sometimes when there's a huge crowd, for me it's a little overwhelming. I don't know about you. And sometimes the crowd is so big that I kind of, I almost mentally or emotionally, I can almost back off a little bit, you know, because it's just, it's so big, it's so much. And here's this beautiful picture of Jesus, God the Son, God in the flesh, who shows us His heart. And it is not to back off, and it's not to say, well, I can't work with everybody, so I'll just work with a few. It is not, it is not, wow, it's too much for me, but God sees the crowd and the need, and He has compassion on them. His heart is moved, and that is God. That is God. And so we see this picture here. And then, he says, they're helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We spoke about this last week. And then let's see what happens next. And we'll focus on this for a while this morning. He said to his disciples, I want to stop there just a minute. To whom does Jesus speak when he sees the need? To whom does he speak? To his disciples. To his disciples. Do you know that that, when God wants His work done in the earth. When God wants something done, to whom does He speak? To whom will He always speak? He speaks to disciples. He speaks to disciples. Why? Because disciples are people who are close to Him. You see, in the time of Jesus, you could not be a disciple unless you were close to the teacher. That was the, in fact, what would happen is the the teacher would almost, if you will, he would sometimes he would sorry, I'm gonna go off the camera. Just a minute. If he were if he were if he had a robe or a cloak, he would take his cloak and he would throw it over the disciple and that would be come follow me. It was a calling of the disciple. And the person had to be close. And so 
he would he would take the club, so come follow me and be my disciple, and then that person would walk with the teacher, would live with the teacher, would eat with the teacher, would stay with the teacher. And so to be a disciple requires closeness to the teacher. To be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ requires closeness with Jesus. It's not just, I'm going to work for you, God. There are a lot of people who work for God, but they may not be disciples. And a disciple means you're close to Jesus. You're close to Jesus. And when you're close to Jesus, what happens then? He speaks to you. He speaks to you. You will hear His voice. You will feel Him calling you. You will know, oh Lord, you're calling me. Lord, you're needing me. You're leading me. Now me personally, some of you may have, I have not. I've never heard an audible voice of the Lord. And some of you may have that, that, I don't know. But I can tell you there are times in my life when it was so clear that the Lord was leading me. And the Lord was directing me and the Lord was guiding me. And I know you would say the same thing as well. And when we are disciples of the Lord, He will speak to us. And when He speaks to us, He will speak to us what is His heart and what is His vision. And so Jesus sees the need and then He turns to His disciples and He says to His disciples... What does he say? Look with me. Does he say to his disciples, Disciples, go out into the harvest fields. Is that what he says? Yes or no? No. What does he say? Harvest is great. The workers are few. So what do you do? Pray. Okay. So the first thing he says to them is pray. Here's the need. But he doesn't say, Now go out and fill the need. What does he say? Pray. And why? Does the Lord of the harvest say pray? Why does he say pray? Because we are to be led not first by need, though the need is great. And, and understand me, please understand me. There are needs everywhere. There are needs in Hong Kong. There are needs in the Philippines. There are needs in India in parts of Africa, in North America, in North Korea, in Myanmar, in Vietnam, there are needs everywhere, and they're all needs, and they're all legitimate. But the Lord of the harvest will tell you where to go. The Lord of the harvest will tell you what to do. And God has a place for every one of us, in prayer or in person. Every one of us, in prayer or in person, God has a place for us. So what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? When are we going to do it? We find out through prayer. We find out through prayer. And so Jesus, the Lord of the harvest, says to his disciples, they're close with him, they're walking with him, he says to them, pray to the Lord of the harvest. There's a need, you pray. And first and foremost, you and I, though our hearts, listen, though our hearts are stirred by need, and they should be, the heart that is the heart of God is stirred by need. And we must, be, we must be stirred. If we are not stirred by need, our hearts are hard. God help us to break our hearts with what breaks His heart. And our hearts are stirred by need. But we must be led by God. We must be led by God. And so we pray. And as we pray, so Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest and ask Him to send workers into His fields. I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters. I've been a Christian a long time. I've been a pastor a long, long time. And I've been in so many different churches and I've seen so many different situations. And honestly, I have seen people that have been sent out by churches, I, I have, and you probably have as well, and I've looked and I've thought, what in the world are they doing? Because there's very little sense that they've been sent by God. Now they've been sent by an organization. They've been sent by a group. But an organization is not the Lord of the harvest. A group is not the Lord of the harvest. A church is not the Lord of a, of a harvest. And God has His hand in all of those things. We know that God established Lighthouse more than 20 years ago. We know that God's, God clearly led. But you know what? As strongly mission-minded as we are, as strongly mission-minded as Logos Hope is, they're not the Lord of the harvest. We're not the Lord of the harvest. There's a Lord of the harvest because there's only one. There's only one who gave his life. There's only one who gave his life, who shed his blood. He's the Lord of the harvest. And it is his harvest field. It's not my harvest field. That's why, you know, sometimes 
sometimes organizations, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but it's true, and sometimes churches too, we get kind of possessive, don't we? It's mine, and it's mine, and it's mine. Brothers and sisters, that is so far from the heart of God. It's not ours. It's not mine. It's God's. It's God's. He's the Lord of the harvest. He's the one that paid the price to buy people back. So he's paid the price. But what he's looking for is workers who will go then and do the work, the, re the, the harvesting of what he has paid for. And it's going to take work. But he's the Lord of the harvest. And so he says to his disciples, you pray to the Lord of the harvest. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. You pray and ask him to send. And when the Lord sends workers into his harvest fields. Now, do we always make it? We don't always make it. Do sometimes people fail? Sometimes people fail because we're imperfect. Do we make mistakes sometimes? Sure we do. Sure we do. But we keep on going. And when the Lord of the harvest sends you, sends you, then you can go with confidence. When you've heard the voice of the Lord who's in charge of the harvest, you can stay with it. I've told you this, I think, a long time ago, but I think it's been a long time, and, and I, I, I'm thinking about it now as I look at this. I, the Lord called me to China, mainland China, many, many years ago at this point. Um, that's where Brother Keith and I became friends so many years ago now. Older than some of you are, are in, your, in, in age. Um, and it was so clear. I knew that the Lord had called me. I had been out of university several years. I was teaching at university. I was teaching English literature and writing at university in the United States. And the Lord spoke so clearly to me, so clearly to me. And I want to encourage you because I did not go to seminary. I did not go to Bible school. I have done a lot of studying since then because God has called me. But I was a university, I was a university professor and the Lord called me. You see, God doesn't really, can God use our education? Sure He can, but He doesn't have to have it. What God, what God wants is us. And it, doesn't, it really doesn't matter what we're doing, what, what we're doing. God can call us if we're available. But anyhow, um, God spoke so clearly. I'd been teaching for three years at university, and the very next year I was going to have tenure in the English department which is a great thing at a university. It was great. I mean, I was going to have a tenured position and the, the uh, chairman of the department loved me and I really liked him and it was, it was great. It was very, very comfortable and God spoke, go to China. And you all know some of the details. The, the change in, in income I made in the United States, I made in one month more than I made in one year in China. More in one month than I made in one year. It was it was a huge but and I'm not saying that I'm not saying that to boast. I'm really not I had school loans and things to pay off. But God was so faithful and there was so much joy. Brothers and sisters, when you hear the voice of the Lord of the harvest calling you, and I don't mean giving up your job and going halfway around the world. He calls us wherever we are. Now, some of us have gone. We've left our homes, haven't we, as, as many of you have. But it's not always that way. It's the, you see, the Lord of the harvest, He calls us here in Hong Kong. He calls us in our work. He calls us in our schools. He calls us in our, in our families. It's still, the, it's still the Lord of the harvest. So don't, don't look at me and say, oh, well, I can't do that. He's not calling me to that. I can't do that. That's not how God works. The Lord of the harvest doesn't work that way. But I heard his voice, and I knew it was God, and I answered. And so I went to China, and I had such great dreams. And you've heard me tell you this before. I, I was so proud. I was going to save China for God. Uh, all of northern China. I got it, God. And to, to be really honest with you, I was very sincere. And that summer before I went, as I was preparing, I was praying, I was getting up early every morning. I was fasting. I was fasting and praying and waiting on the Lord. And the Lord was calling me. So I was hearing the, the voice of the Lord of the harvest. He was calling me. So I wanted to be prepared. I wanted to be prepared. And I went to northern China that first year. It was a disaster. I mean, really, it was a disaster. It was so difficult. I think, I think now, and I can laugh. I couldn't laugh at the time. All I could do at the time was cry. And no joke, I was crying. I would 
I would come in from classes and I would cry. I was miserable. I was sick. I had frostbite because it was northern China. I had frostbite on my toes and on my fingers. Keith knows. He, in those early days, there wasn't enough heat. Um, it was terrible. And in November, sometime around my birthday, I came in from class one day. I threw myself across the bed, boo-hooing, crying, 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 because it was so awful. And that, by the way, that first year, I told zero people about the Lord Jesus. Nobody wanted to hear. Nobody wanted to know. All I did was teach English. That was it. But anyway, I threw myself across the bed. I was boo-hooing. And I thought, I want to go home. And a voice in my heart said, you can go home. And I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can go home. I really did. It was, I'm being, you know, as your pastor, one of your pastors, I try to be really honest with you because you know I don't float on a cloud. I'm really a person, just like you. <laughs> uh, except I cry sometimes, maybe. And I heard that voice. I thought, I can. I can go home. Home is great. Mom and Dad love me there. I can get my job back and make money again. Um, I don't have to eat this terrible food because in, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm being really honest. And you know I love Chinese food. But you know what? In 1986, in northern China, in the winter time, do you know what we ate? Thank you, Keith. You were in northern China in winter time too, weren't you? We ate bok choy, or bai cai, the big one, da bai cai, the big, we ate, we, we ate stir-fried cabbage, that was it, with a little bit of fat, sometimes that was, there was no meat, and I don't, maybe Beijing had more than we had, and we ate, we ate stir-fried onions, just big, big, big place of onions, I, I, I'm serious, you think I'm exaggerating, I am not exaggerating, this is the truth, this is the truth, and, if, and that was about it, miserable, miserable and I lay across the bed crying and I'm, I'm really not dramatizing I I was I wanted to go home and I was that close to going home let me tell you why I did not go home and let me tell you why I'm standing here because you know what if I had gone home that November I would not be here now I would not be I don't know where I'd be. I'd probably be teaching at university in the States right now, maybe. Maybe I'd have moved up higher and I'd have my PhD and so forth and so on because I loved those things. I really did. I loved, I loved all of that. The only reason I'm here is because as I lay crying across the bed that afternoon, I knew that I knew that I knew I had heard the voice of the Lord of the Harvest. I knew he had called me to China. I knew he had. It was so clear, and I knew it. And that was the only thing that kept me. It was like a, don't think of this in a bad way. Think of it in a good way. It was like a hammer hammered through my heart that kept me there. And I mean this in a good way, not in a bad way. Brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic this morning, but I want to tell you, you have to know in this world that's shifting, that's changing, that there are storms that come, and there are things that knock us off our feet, and that disappoint us, that push us back, and we will go through these things. You have to know that you have heard the voice of the Lord. You've got to know it. You've got to know it. I don't care what God has called you to do. I don't care where you live. I don't care what work you have to do in a secular form in this world or if it is a work, uh, um, another, wor another type of work that the Lord has given you. You've got to know that you've heard the voice of the Lord. This is not just for pastors, brothers and sisters. This is for every one of us. You've got to know, God, I've heard your voice. God, I've heard your voice. And when you know that, it will keep you. It will keep you. And then you can say, God, I know I heard you. Lord, I know I heard you. And you've got to know that because the enemy will come and the enemy will try to knock you off your feet and troubles will come and you think, maybe it wasn't God because if it were, if it were God, I wouldn't be going through all of this now. And that's when you've got to know, God, I heard your voice. God, I know it was you. 
You've got to hear the voice of the Lord. Every one of you, whatever your age, you've got to know, God, I heard you. God, I know that I'm, I'm following you. I don't understand everything, and I didn't understand why it was so miserable and so difficult that first year. It took me about three or four years to understand why I went through so many troubles that first year. I can tell you now, and you probably know it, it's because I was so full of me and what I was going to do and so proud and very little humility, God couldn't really use me because I was so full of me. And God had to, had to allow circumstances and bad food and frostbite and loneliness, loneliness to break me so that He would have something that was broken in His hands that He could do something with. But I didn't know that at the time. I didn't understand that at the time. May I encourage you, brothers and sisters, if you have gone through, I believe this is a word, of, a word from the Lord for some of you right now. Some of you have gone through a very long and disappointing time of breaking, and you don't understand why, and you're thinking, God, have I done something wrong? God, have I sinned? Have I made a mistake? Am I, am I in the wrong place? And what I want to say to you, and I believe this is from the Lord right now, you are not in the wrong place. You haven't sinned. You haven't done something wrong. But God is allowing that in love to break you and to soften you so that He can do something with you. He can do something with you. That's what God is doing. You see, God wants to do something in and through each one of us. Each one of us. So I prayed. And I knew I'd heard God's voice. And because of that, I stayed. Had my circumstance, did my circumstances change? No. <laughs> no. Did the frostbite get better? No. <laughs> did I get more heat? No. Did I get a whole bunch of new friends? No. Did I suddenly lead a hundred people to the Lord? No. But God kept me there, and I knew I had heard Him. And so I stayed. And so I stayed. And I stayed because I knew I'd heard the voice of the Lord. And so, brothers and sisters, you've got to hear the voice of the Lord. And in this case, Jesus is talking to His disciples, and He says, pray to Him and ask Him to send workers into the field. Now, that was a bit of a detour, but I believe that was in the Lord's message for us this morning. And so Jesus then says, you pray to the Lord of the harvest and ask Him to send workers into the fields. And brothers and sisters, the Lord is the one who sends. The Lord is the one who sends. Do you know what? It's not a church that sends. No church sent me. A church will fail. A church may fall. A church may falter. But the Lord never changes. He never fails. He never falters. And so the Lord of the harvest is the one who sends. And so he says to them, pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. And I love this prayer because this is the prayer of a disciple. Do you see that? We've talked about this some, but I, I feel like we should talk about it more this week. And in this second service, we may not get, we definitely won't get as far into the second part of this message as we did in the first service. So you all got part of, you're going to get it all this morning. Um, and so we pray to the Lord of the harvest and ask Him to send workers into His fields. And this is a beautiful prayer because it's the prayer of a disciple. It's the prayer of a disciple. When we are not yet disciples, when we're in the process of becoming disciples, do you know what our prayers will usually be? When we're learning to become disciples, and we're still baby disciples maybe, baby disciples, do you know which way our prayers go? Me! Lord, bless me. Lord, help me. Lord, my family. Lord, my needs. Lord, my this. Lord, me, 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 me. Now, that's part of it because the Lord loves us and He answers prayers. He does. He cares about us. But brothers and sisters, when we begin to grow up in the Lord and we begin to grow up as disciples, the Lord will change some of our prayers from not just me and my family and what touches me, but to move outward. And if you have not yet prayed very much outwardly beyond yourself, beyond your family, beyond your needs, 
The Lord wants to grow you up in Him. The Lord wants you to grow up in discipleship. And the Lord wants you to begin to see what He sees. Because He sees beyond you. Does He love you? Yes! Amen! I am, of one thing, I am so convinced. I know the Lord loves me. I know, I know, I know. And I hope you know that too. And I prayed that when I was a young Christian because I struggled with the love of the Lord. I felt like He didn't really love me. Um, I felt like he, he was judging me. And I really prayed, God, help me to understand. Help me to see. Because when you're secure in love, that's, that's, a, that's a great place to be. Then you can, keep, you can really keep going. And so the Lord worked in my life and my heart. But you know what? That was just the beginning of what God wanted to do in my heart and life and the same thing for you because God wants to get you from beyond just yourself moving outwardly. And so as we begin to grow up in Him, the prayer and the heart of a true disciple, of one who is growing, will be you'll look outside of just your circle. You'll begin looking outward. And so the Lord says to His disciples, not just followers, not just those who are sort of interested, not just churchgoers, but he says to his disciples, you pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers. That's the, that's the prayer of a disciple. And he says to them, ask him to send more workers into his fields. And I love this. You know, I told you I, to, I, told you I, used, to be in, I used to teach English, right? So I love words. And that's one of the things that God has put in my heart. I really do. So I love, there's a word right here that I love. It's really small. You know what word it is? It's this word right here. His. I love this word. Have you noticed that before? It's not just ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers out into the fields, the world. There's this little word right here and it says it's his fields. It's his fields. And you say, yeah, but the devil sure is controlling the world. Sure he is. There are areas of the world through religions and through oppressive regime, political regimes and things like that where the enemy seems to be in control of things. But here's the truth of it. Here's the truth of it. They are his fields. Why? Because he's paid the price. He's paid the price. And what he's looking for and what he needs is those who will go into the harvest fields in person, or in prayer, or in pesos. <laughs> because it takes all, it takes all, it does. In person, or in prayer, or in pesos. To go into the harvest fields, all of that is part of the going. They're His fields because He's paid the price. He's paid the price. Now He's the Lord of the harvest, so what else does that mean? That means He's going to tell us how to harvest because there are different ways of harvesting, aren't there? What are some ways of harvesting that we know? Let's see. Mm, rice. How do you harvest rice? A sickle, right? A sickle, and in some places machines now, but a sickle, okay? How do you harvest potatoes? You dig them up, okay? How do you harvest peanuts? You dig them up or you pull... Low tech. You pull them up, right? You pull them up and then you turn them over and you let them stay in the field and dry for and shake off the dirt and then you let them dry for a while. I've done that. And then you pick them off the vine, right? That's what we used to do. You know, I told you I'm a farm girl. I'm, I'm, I'm all dressed up. You should see me when I was a farm girl. My fingers all dirty from getting peanuts. How do you harvest tomatoes? You pick them, that's right. And generally, tomatoes have to be picked by hand because machines will bruise the fruit and it's quite deli delicate. How do you harvest bananas? I found that out in the first service. I said, you pick them. And all the Filipinos said, no, 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 Pastor. No, 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 no. You see? I'm not the Lord of the harvest, right? There you go. They said, no, you cut. You cut. And there are different methods of harvesting for different crops. Now, if you were to talk to Brother Andrew here, you know Brother Andrew is a great farmer right there, and he's got all sorts of things. And every once in a while, he'll bring, last year when the tomato crops came, his tomatoes, he brought these beautiful little, these little sweet tomatoes that he picked by hand. But we ask the Lord of the harvest because there are different methods for harvesting. There are different methods for harvesting. And so I don't know because I'm not the Lord of the harvest, but He is. And when I ask Him and He sends me, He will show me how to harvest that crop. That's what He does. And maybe here, 
It's with a big, is it a ship or a boat? It's a ship. I get those words. There's a specific term, right? A ship and boat. Okay, it's a big ship. There's a way of harvesting in that way. You know I'm from South Alabama inland. I'm, I'm, I don't know a lot about boats or ships. That's a way of harvesting. Summer English camp was a way of harvesting. Medical mission in the Philippines, it's a way of harvesting. Teaching English in classrooms in Hong Kong, it's a way of harvesting. Business people as clients come into your offices, it's a way of harvesting. Parents with your children and other children, in the markets with employers, it's different ways of harvesting and the Lord of the harvest shows us how. Now, the disciples pray and then I want us to look at chapter 10 verse 1. Let's go forward just a little bit. Matthew 10, verse 1, a few verses passed. He says, pray to the Lord of the harvest, ask him to send forth workers into the fields, and then we move forward right here, Matthew 10, verse 1, very next verse, and what do we see? Jesus called what? He, he called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Now what picture do we see here? Look with me for just a minute. He calls them together, they're his disciples, and he gives them authority. What does that mean? He gives them the tools, right? He gives them what is needed. If they don't have the authority of Jesus, they cannot do his work. If you haven't received from Jesus what you need to do his work, you can't do his work. Oh, there are a lot of people who try, right? They try, 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 and they get so tired, and they try harder, and they jump up and down, and they do this and they that, and, but we cannot do the work of the Lord in our own strength. We cannot do the work of the Lord with our own tools. It has to be His tools. And that's why we have to pray. And that's why we have to spend time with Him. That's why when we went to Sichuan, we didn't just plan English lessons and go off and say, now we're going to teach English lessons and tell them about Jesus. We had to pray. Why? Because we had to have tools to do His work. He calls them together, and then He gives them authority to do what? Cast out evil spirits, heal diseases and illnesses. Now... We're not going to do this, do this this morning, but you can do it on your own after this morning. You go back and you read Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. What do you find in Matthew chapter 9? If you go back and read, you will find out that Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 was what? Casting out evil spirits and he was healing every kind of disease and illness. That's what he was doing. And then he calls his disciples together. He gives them his tools. And he says then, and so he gives them his tools to do what he had done. We are called to do what Jesus did in this earth. We are called to love the unlovable. Un ah, laughing now, aren't we? That's right. To love the unlovable. To teach. You say, oh, no, I'm, not, I'm not a teacher. Well, there are other things that you can do. Every one of us, guess what? All you need is God's heart to love people. You don't need any special gifts for that. You just need the grace of God and the love of God. And every one of us can love people or teach or this or that. And Jesus then equips his disciples as he equips you and me to do what he did. That's what we're to do. That's what we're to do. But let's not stop there. Now, Matthew 10, verse 5. What do we see next? Ah, look at what happens next. We read here, Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. And so he gives directions. He gives them, this is what you're supposed to do. Are they called disciples now? Yes or no? No. What are they called now? They're called apostles. Why aren't they called apostles here? This is Matthew writing. Okay. Uh, this uh, Matthew, the, the, uh, the tax collector. Okay. Why does Matthew use the word apostles instead of disciples here? A disciple is one who's learning. A disciple is one who's training. What does the word apostle mean? Apostle means a sent one. A sent one. So in a very real sense, in a very real sense, when we are called, when Jesus sends us out, we become apostles. We become apostles. We are sent out by Him. And the word here, when Jesus sent, 
And in the preceding chapter where it said, ask the Lord to send workers, do you know what that word send means? It is not, okay, bye, go out into the fields. <laughs> do you know what that word is? Jean, please come here. I'm going to demonstrate this word. She doesn't know what I'm going to do. I don't want you to fall down, but come up here. Come here, okay? There are the fields. I'm the Lord of the harvest, okay? Now, don't, I don't want you to fall down, okay? This is what the word means, to send. It means, I'm going to push you, okay? It means to, I don't want her to fall. I don't want a lawsuit, okay? It means to, to push or to thrust forth. That's what it means. Thank you, Jean. That's what that word means. It's not a soft, gentle word, but it really, it's a strong word that really means just to, oof, to push out into the harvest fields. It really is. That's what the word means. And that's how it's, so it's not this lovely little, oh, okay, whatever. But I love that, that idea and that picture when you think about it. He pushes us, he thrusts us, he sends us out into the harvest fields. And so here we have this picture now in verse 5. He sent them out, he thrust them out into the harvest fields with directions. And here we see as we approach the end this morning, we're not, we're not going to get to the second part. We'll get to that next week. Three lost things. That's part two that comes in next week. What we see here is this, and I want you to get the picture here this morning. Jesus tells his disciples to pray. Yes? Yes. 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 Is there any record of the disciples praying in these verses? Yes or no? No. Do you think they prayed? I think they prayed. Why? Because here he says pray, and a few verses later, what happens? There's the answer to prayer, right? There's the answer to prayer. He, who's the Lord of the harvest? Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. And what does he do to the, to the disciples slash apostles? He gives them authority, and then he says, go! And he thrusts them out into the harvest fields. Here's what I have found. Here's what I have found. If you will pray, if you will pray, God will use you in some way as an answer to your prayer. He will. He will. He will use you in some way as He did in the Sichuan summer camp. He will use you. If you're not praying, it is unlikely that God will use you as an answer to prayer. It's, it's very unlikely. But what happens when we pray is this. When we start praying, when we start praying, we start seeing the need with His eyes. When we start praying, we will be moved with compassion. We'll, we'll, we'll have His eyes. We will develop His heart. His heart, that's what happens. We develop His heart. And as we develop His heart, when we have the heart of the Lord, then He can use us for His purposes. If our hearts are not the heart of the Lord, if our hearts are hard, if our hearts are only concerned with our own affairs and our own things, the things that just touch us, the Lord can use us. He can. He can use you, and He will use you, but it will generally be a very limited circle. It will. It'll be a very limited, because He'll only be able to use you where your heart is touched, and that may be just your family, or just one or two people that are your, your close friend. I don't want my friend to go to hell. I want them to know Jesus. I don't want them to die and go to hell. And so you're touched. But when your heart grows, and God begins to make your heart like His heart, and He grows, then he can use you for much more. He can. And then He will begin to, as He gives you His heart, He'll begin to use you to, to reach as the Lord of the harvest to move further afield. I, I told you before about one of the women that I'm praying for where I live. And I haven't seen her in quite a while. I've talked with some people about her. The little old Hakka lady. Remember I've told you that? You know, Hakka, that's the, that's the, uh, uh, they wear the, they wear the black hat, the, the black hat, and usually it's, they're very, very elderly. Um, and I, I remember I would drive out of my old village. Remember I told you I saw her squatting 
beside the road. She was obviously poor. She had almost no shoes on. Um, she was so thin. She probably weighs maybe 70 pounds, honestly, maybe 75 pounds. Small and shriveled, one or two teeth, doesn't speak a word of English, doesn't speak Mandarin, doesn't speak Cantonese. I mean, she's a ha she, she speaks Hakka. And I used to drive by her day after day after day. She'd often be out by the road in the old village where I lived. And mom and dad had come for a visit and dad, mom and dad were in the car with me as I drove by and I said, there's that lady. And I, I, I honestly, I'd never prayed for her. She was so different from me. She was so foreign. How could I ever communicate with her? And I said, there's that lady. I see her, whatever. And I remember my mom or my dad saying, looked at her and, and said, how will she ever hear about the love of Jesus? And when, he, when they said that, when one of my parents said that, God struck my heart. And I thought, oh, Lord, that's true. How will she ever hear? I can't communicate with her. And then I moved into the, into the place where I lived for the last two years. And remember I told you, I was parking my car one day and I looked up and there was that little lady. There was that little lady. We live in the same village. We live in the same village and she, has, she always walks around with a little stick and she has just plastic slippers. I mean, in the winter time, plastic slippers even. And she was walking and I thought, God, how can I show her? How can I show her? I can't communicate with her. I thought, God, what can I do? And I would try to talk to her and people would look at me like I was so weird because, you know, here she was. Here I am, this Westerner. What in the world am I doing? And the only thing I could do, I would just speak to her in Mandarin and a little bit of Cantonese. That's all I can do. But I started praying. I really started praying. Why? Not because I'm so special, but because the Lord started changing my heart and I asked Him to. And at, at, at Mid-Autumn Festival, I took some, I don't remember who gave me some mooncakes. Ida's employers gave me some mooncakes. And I took those mooncakes and I shared them with her. Remember, I, remember what I told her? I said, I said, these are in Cantonese. I said, these are for you. And she looked at me. She looked at them. Then she looked at me and she said, you don't want them. <laughs> and I said, no. I said, they're good. I like them. I said, but they're for you. She looked at me and she said, okay. And she took them. She never said thank you. <laughs> and that's okay. And she took them and she walked off. And she'd turn around and she'd look at me. And she'd just look at me. And I thought, okay, Lord, how can I reach her? And then at Chinese New Year, I got some oranges. And you know what? For days, because I didn't know where she lived in the village, for days, I would carry the bag of oranges. <laughs> I'm serious. I'd carry them back and forth and back and forth, carrying them, wait for, Lord, Help me to see her. Lord, help me to see her until one day I saw her again. And then I gave her the oranges as well. And whenever I see her, if I can, I'll try to stop or I'll try to say hello and I'll try to speak. That's all I can do. And I can pray. And I can pray. But the Lord started expanding my heart. And what I want to say as we, as we do come to a close is this. If we're not praying and we're not listening to the voice of the Lord of the harvest, we will only... We will only ever care about our loved ones and we will only ever care about people like ourselves, right? We really will. I'll only care about Americans. I won't care about people of other skin color. I won't care about people that are poorer than I am or richer than I am or I'll care about people like me. But the Lord of the harvest sees the fields and He cares for them all. And when we pray to the Lord of the harvest, He touches our hearts and changes our hearts. And then sometimes He has to thrust us forth into the harvest fields because they're His harvest fields. And He will give us a heart. He'll give us a heart for people who are not like us. He'll give us a heart for people that, whose language we do not speak, but we can show love. Because love will speak louder than any language that we can learn of this earth. Love will speak. And love is the language of the Lord of the harvest. It's the language of the Lord of the harvest. And we don't get that by studying books. We don't even get that by coming to church. We get that by spending time with the Lord of the harvest. And He changes our hearts. Let's close in prayer. 
Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you this morning again that you speak to us through your word. And Father, we confess we are pretty poor harvesters sometimes. God, we, all of us, Lord, and I include myself, sometimes we're so caught up and tied up with just the things that interest us. And God, sometimes we go, get so busy working for you that we don't, we don't always see the harvest. Our hearts aren't always moved with compassion. But Lord, we want to be your disciples. And we want to be your apostles. We want to be taught by you and learn of you. And we want to be sent forth by you. We want to hear your voice. Lord, I pray that we as your people would wait on you and wait with you and spend time with you. That you would speak to us that in every area of our lives, whether it is going out into the harvest fields or whether it is for other areas of our lives, in each move, in each stage, in each direction, in our relationships with our family, with our friends, with our employers or employees, wherever we are, that we will know we have heard your voice. We've heard your voice. You've spoken to us. And thus we can stand. And thus we can stay. And thus we can move and love and go because we've heard the voice of the Lord of the harvest. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.